Um, so um, uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Katia Calderon, and I'm one of the staff advisors here with the under with the Yellow Cluster undergraduate advising team. Um, and I'll go ahead and pass it on to Alyssa, who is jo joining us here today. Hey everyone, my name is Alyssa McGorian. I use she, her, her pronouns, and I'm an undergraduate advisor in the Yellow Cluster. I'm excited to hear what our awesome panel of grad students has to say and um, answer any questions on the advising side. <laughs> All right, Katya, do we want to, shall I platform to one of our, our grad students? Um, I think we can go in the order of um, Lucy, Jenny, Adam, and Shia, and then, um, yeah, you can go ahead and um, introduce yourself, your name, your year, and area of study, and anything else you would like to share, just so um, the participants just get to know you a little bit better. Hi, I'm Lucy. Um, I'm a first year in the developmental psychology program. Um, I'm from San Diego, California. And before this, I worked at UC Irvine, so another UC. Um, love the UCs. Hey, hey, my name is Jenny. I am the second year quant student. Uh, I'm from Taiwan, so I'm also an international student. If anyone wants to ask questions about um, like how to apply for visas, what's the process um, for like uh, international students applying. Hi, my name is Adam. I use he, his, him pronouns. And I'm a third year in the social and personality psychology area. Um, I'm from Mojave, California, uh, and I am a member of the LGBTQ community. So if you have questions about being queer and navigating grad school, I'm more than happy to talk about that. Hi, I'm Shay. Um, I'm a fourth year in uh, perception, cognition, and cognitive neuroscience area. Um, I work with Joy Gang, and my uh, research is on like attention and memory. Um, I am a first-gen college student, um, so I went to Cal Poly Pomona for undergrad, um, and then I moved up here for grad school. So happy to talk about any sort of like first-gen struggles if you have questions about that. Thank you all for sharing. Um, uh, we're very happy to have our panelists here um, share some valuable information and some advice with you all. Um, so we will go ahead and get started with, um, we have a set of questions prepared ahead of time uh, for our panelists. Um, and the first few questions are in regards to the grad, grad application process and, prepar and preparing for grad school. Um, so the first question um, that we have is um, for our panelists is, um, how would you describe the process for applying to graduate school and what advice do you have for students entering this stage? And feel free to go in the same order that you um, introduce yourself. Yeah, so this is a really important question. Um, and as like a first year, I feel like it's still a very familiar process to me. Like it felt like it just happened. So the the first part was what, how do you describe the process? And I think for me, it was a very long process uh, in that I started early and it took like a long time. Um, my suggestion would be to also like start early and take your time. Um, it's a very like daunting process to start. I know in terms of figuring out what you want to study, who you might want to work with, where you might want to work and study. Um, but that's why I like to describe it as a really long process. Um, advice for students entering this stage I think really focusing on your interests um, and who's also pursuing those interests regardless of like maybe location or school or anything I really focused on who was doing the work that I wanted to do and then later on you know narrowed down by like other specific factors but really focusing on that as your main goal and then looking outside of that for like other ways to get there, that would be my main advice. Uh, 
right, so uh, my topic for a science in graduate school uh, studying the results is like the exact opposite of uh, Lucy's. I feel like I I did grad school. I decided to go to grad school um, uh, last quarter of undergrad, so it was it felt very rushed, and I had two months be, uh, of when I graduated uh, undergrad, and then when I started grad school, so there was like no break. Uh, and I would say that like, don't do what I did. Do not decide to go to grad school. Last quarter is very stressful. Uh, and I wish that I would have prepared sooner, you know, like really think about at least what field I want to go in. And like, I wish uh, if it's not for COVID like junior year to start on looking for last class, getting experience. Um, but uh, don't like, push yourself like if you really feel like you're not ready and you want to take a gap year or two that's totally fine but um definitely like think about it not at the last quarter like at least a year or two quarters in advance so um you have the the mental to go through and do the applications yeah similar to jenny i also kind of decided last minute to apply to grad school and it was not fun I had like um two months kind of like Jenny did to kind of get everything together and there's a lot that goes into it so I wish I had you know taken the time to um really sort things out because there's multiple like personal statements you have to write and not every grad school they have very similar prompts but you have to kind of massage it a little bit uh for each grad school um there's also I'm not I guess schools are different now but then it was like you know finding the time to take the GRE um and study for it you know um that so there's a lot that goes into it so I think kind of just echoing what Jenny has said just be like it doesn't hurt to take a year or two off I also took a gap year in between my undergrad and grad school um and if I could go back I think I would also take that gap year just to one be sure um, it was what I wanted to do. Um, I'm not having any doubts. I'm really glad where I ended up um, just clarifying that. But two, I think more so to give me more of that time because beforehand I had spent times looking into kind of what Lucy's saying, you know, what is it that I wanted to study? And also, you know, who is studying what I'm studying? Um, what do they do? Do I see myself as a good fit? And that takes time trying to figure out, you know, is do the research interests align enough that we can have this really productive kind of time when I'm in grad school. Um, so don't rush anything. I think my advice, you know, if you have the time, take things slow. Um, I guess the other advice I would give is like, if you are feeling like you want to go to grad school, it's never too late to like set things up, you know, kind of get yourself some letter letters of references, you know, maybe if you have to take an exam to get in, start studying for that in little chunks. Um, yeah. I, that, that's all I have about that, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll just sort of echo everything that everyone just said. Um, I went more of Lucy's route, so I started like as early as possible, um, which for me was my second year. Um, I knew I wanted to go to grad school, and so I started like applying for multiple labs and um, trying to like get all those things, those line items on my CV, which I think ultimately was really helpful. Um, and also being organized because it is like, there's so much to sort of juggle. Um, so knowing all of your deadlines, knowing when you should ask for letters of reference, knowing when you have to take your GRE and when you want to have like your sort of like study benchmarks done by. Um, and so I personally got like spreadsheets from people that I knew who had already applied and gotten in um, and made sort of spreadsheets of like the timeline for everything. Um, and I found that that took off, it like offloaded a lot of the stress of trying to like keep everything in my working memory. Um, so I, I would really recommend something like that, like get some type of organizational tool that works for you um, so that you can sort of offload your stress onto, you know, the computer and um, you can just sort of like follow those um, timelines as you go along. Uh, Chloe, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? 
Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm very sorry. I was a little late. Um, I'm teaching this quarter, so my, my students are entering the uh, the final group project phase of the quarter and needed a little uh, extra time. Um, but I'm Chloe Kereskevich. I'm a sixth year in biological psychology. Um, so I'm in my, my final push to graduation in June. Um, I... I actually work with primates, so this informs my answer to the, the question a little bit. Um, there are not a lot of psychology programs that have partnerships with uh, primate research, so whether that's a primate center or a university that has a population of primates. So um, I knew when I started working with primates that um, in my freshman year of undergrad that, you know, if I wanted to go the research route, I was going to need to do a lot of networking and um, get people to introduce me around uh, kind of our area of research. Um, and I actually did take two years off. I went and did a fellowship at NIH called the um, IRTA, the IRTA Fellowship. It's a two-year research-based um, program specifically for uh, pre-med or pre-grad school folks who are interested in the biological sciences. Um, so that was a really great opportunity for me to gain skills that I didn't get working in the lab that I came up in an undergrad. Um, and that made me a really competitive applicant for graduate school. So I knew, despite working in a lab for four years, um, I had a lot of behavioral experience with primates, but not a lot of um, the biological or, you know, lab-based skills that I was going to need. Um, and it also helped me hone my research interests. So I had a better understanding of what I wanted to study and what was really important to me um, and what kind of labs were doing that work. So I ended up here. Obviously, we have a primate center. It was a, a really good fit for me, um, but I really loved taking those two years off. It helped me combat my burnout um, from undergrad. I had a really like big senior thesis, research heavy uh, senior year. So I think you know only having a couple months off would have been really hard for me. Um, but having those two years was a great opportunity, and I also got some publications um, from the research that I was doing during that time. So. They actually all came out while I was in graduate school, so it didn't necessarily help my CV uh, when I was applying, but um, I think those experiences made me a better applicant and helped me get prepared for the rigor of graduate school. Thank you all for sharing. Um, so the second question that we have um, for you all is, uh, what should students consider when researching graduate programs? Yeah, I think there are a lot of things to consider, both in like things that you need to have and things that you would like to have. I found myself kind of like sorting things into those two categories. Um, primarily, like research interest should be, I think, like the number one thing. Like, do you see yourself being happy working on research in the lab that you're applying to? Like, does their research excite you? Does the PI excite you? Do they seem like somebody that you could work with like both both personally but also like with their publications is that stuff exciting to you and like if so yes that's great then I think that's a good metric for figuring out your research fit um but another big one to consider is like funding opportunities um that's a big constraint like depending on departments depending on schools so doing a lot of research into the kind of funding that you'll need um the kind of work that you want to do so are you okay TAing and like setting aside time for that? Or like, are there fellowships that you want to apply to? Does the school that you're applying to offer them? Are there outside fellowships you can apply to? Um, those would be, those are the two main ones that I considered when I was applying. Also, of course, like geographical location. Um, if you can like consider it, that's great too. Um, in terms of like options about where you want to live. I feel like a lot of times like, the school like comes before the the like location in terms of where you're applying but it's also important to like choose a place that you know that you would be happy living in like if you're not going to be if you can't do the cold and you you got admitted or something to a school in like the midwest and like you know that that is something that makes you depressed and sad like i, I don't do that don't it's going to be like 5 to 7 years of your life um that's obviously if you have like opportunities to choose um but I think that's why like maybe applying to schools where you only apply to schools where you know that you would be like at least like decently 
happy is important to do, but also tricky to do. Um, yeah, those would be my my main ones, I think. Yeah, I think Lucy touched on the things that I was going to say anyway. So like we have stuff in common, uh, but mostly I I just want to echo the sentiment that ultimately uh, when you are applying, you're not applying to the school, you're applying to the advisor. Like this is a person you're going to be talking on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. So like make sure that you like this person, like you read their publication and you think it's interesting to you because you're going to be speaking to this person over and over and over again. Uh, it's not like undergrad where you're matched with like a bunch of professors and you get to explore what subject you like. Uh, and then the other thing, environment, again, is like if you don't like the environment, like don't force yourself to go. Um, and then the last thing that I think it's more uncommon that people don't really consider, but I didn't have to consider it, but my friend who applied to grad school did have to, is your partner. So if you have a partner, uh, when you're applying, make sure that not just you, but your partner is okay with moving with you. I know that can cause a lot of strain um, because you don't know where you're going to go. And you're applying to nine schools, there's nine possible locations. So make sure you have your priorities like straight. Um, if your partner is willing to move with you, are you willing to sacrifice career and academics over your partner, which is a terrible decision, but can cause strain and should be considered. Yeah, I think a lot of the things um, that have been said are really important. Um, so just kind of echoing, I think the big thing, a couple things, funding, like Lucy said, is a huge one because there are some programs that it's like, yeah, we'll fund you, but only for the first year. And then you have to find the funding outside of that. So um, I know that tends to be true, I think more in the clinical psych realm uh, differentiating between like, okay, if I'm getting a PhD in clinical psychology, what does that mean versus getting a PsyD where those type of graduate school programs, um, you have to do the funding for yourself or you have to get, um, external funding. That's also true for a lot of master's programs as well. Um, but some master's programs will have things set up where if you TA, you know, they'll waive some of the costs of your tuition. Uh, also echoing geographical, I think it, it's super huge. You know, um, I don't think as a queer person, I would be comfortable going to a school in the Southern states, you know, where rights for my community, trans rights are under attack and that will significantly impact my livelihood. So something that someone told me they did, which I think is really smart is when you're applying to programs, email the department and say, hey, can I talk to somebody who shares this identity with me? And that person, they had to pull someone from the chemistry department and they're like in biological sciences. So that's super telling um, in of itself. So if that's something you're comfortable with doing, I say do it. It saved them, you know, all that time and stress of having applying to that school and investing all that energy. Um, I mean, also like, um, I guess, I know some people, uh, family is a big thing. You know, I've been away from my family for a long time um but it hasn't gotten easier with time you know like being in close proximity I mean, to my family thankfully they're in southern california so it's not too far a drive but i knew if i was further away that would be really hard for me so really prioritizing your well-being um over everything else because as people are saying these are the five years depending on the program you know two to five years of your life where you're going to be staying at the very least you deserve to be happy in the space that you're in um and there's things that i wish Again, I love Davis, you know, it's a really good fit, but if I had applied elsewhere, I don't think these are things I would have realized until afterward. Um, so yeah, just those are some really big things. Sitting for yourself, what's important to you for your livelihood? Yeah, I really agree with Adam um, and everyone who mentioned this, but um, really just making sure that wherever you're going, you'll have the resources that you personally need to succeed. I think for some people, it's super important to go to like a school that is really highly ranked um, because of their personal career goals or whatever it may be. Um, and that's totally fine. But um, like I personally um, really wanted to be in a place where I wasn't too far from my family. 
um, and that I had, I felt like I would have a good support system there. Um, and I found that to be mostly the case with um, my potential cohort here at Davis. Um, and I think that's held up. I feel like I have a good support system here. Um, and I know that for me, that's really important. I need like a community around me um, and I need to be able to go home and visit my family. I'm also from Southern California. So um, I felt like this was the best balance of, um, of things for me. Um, but yeah, think about what is going to be important for you. Do you need to live in a city where you can be around all kinds of, you know, people and places? Um, or do you like living in more of like a smaller town? Um, but overall, I think um, thinking about what resources you need for your immediate future and your long term career goals. So if you are like kind of leaning towards industry positions um, or you're leaning toward, toward an academic position, um, think about where the PI and the lab that you're going to has and the program overall um, has placed their students. So I thought like here, there is sort of a mix of students going to academic and industry positions. Um, I like the proximity to like Silicon Valley. I know that there's like a lot of connections that could be made there. Um, and so I think it's kind of different. There's different cultures and different departments when it comes to like really setting people up for awesome postdocs and awesome like professorships um, versus like really encouraging or discouraging industry positions. So thinking about like long term, um, what your career goals are and what kind of programs are going to help you get there. I think that's really important to consider too. I think everybody brought up really important points. Um, and I, I'll talk about something different um, so that I'm not just uh, just endorsing everyone else's views. But um, I think Jenny brought up a great point about, you know, the mentorship being a really important part of graduate school. Um, some, some programs are rotation based, which means you spend your first year um, in three different labs usually. So you spend about a quarter or a semester in each lab getting to know, you know, that research and that PI. Um, and so those programs, you get a lot of like, actual experience with a person before you choose your mentor. Um, our psychology department and many other psychology departments are what we call direct mentor programs. And so that means you pick a PI um, and apply to work with them directly from the beginning. So when you join a cohort, it's as that person's student. Um, and so a really important part of that kind of pertains to our first question too, um, is you want to make sure that's a good fit for you. And I think a lot of times we I, I did this when I applied to graduate school. I focused on the research being a good fit. Um, in most cases, there's much more flexibility um, about what you do for your research and what possibilities there are. Um, I study something that my PI has never ever studied. Um, so I have someone on my committee that studies sleep uh, because my boss does not. Um, we study it in the, in the context of uh, monogamous primates and that's her no area of emphasis, but um, I brought in new methods and I'm doing research that I never thought I would be doing and something that she's not, you know, the most knowledgeable in. So there is flexibility in, in what my dissertation ended up being about. Um, but I work with my PI every, every day, every week. Like we have a lot of contact. Our lab is very big. We have seven graduate students. And so the group dynamic and knowing like who you're going to work with and how you're going to fit into that is really important. Um, I actually started in a different lab and it was not a good fit for me. So in my second year, I was able to change labs and work with a different PI. Um, so there is some, you know, there are some options depending on, you know, how that mentoring situation works out. But I think a great thing to do is to, you know, when you're asked to come in for an interview um, during, you know, grad admissions and recruitment, um, really talk to the other graduate students, get an idea of what it's like to work for this person. If they are a new PI, so they're younger in the field and they haven't had any graduate students yet, talk to the staff in their lab, um, talk to undergrads that they've mentored. You just, you want a picture of how this person is going to treat you in an everyday situation. Um, you know, ask them what their expectations are of you. Get a really clear view up front if they expect you to check in all the time with them or they expect to be more removed because you want to know if your your desires and your wants are going to be met by this person just as they want to know if what they want out of a graduate student is going to be met by you so i would say that's an interview to uh to walk into and say you know this is who i am this is what i want as much as you want to go to graduate school you don't want to misrepresent what you want because that's just going to harm you in the long run so being really upfront with yourself even about 
what you expect to get out of this experience and this uh, part of your education is going to be really important as you navigate that relationship. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, so the next question um, that we have is a very general one for um, students um, considering grad school and preparing for. Uh, so it's, how can students be competitive applicants for graduate school? So I can kind of talk about what I did to prepare for grad school and then maybe like things that I wish I had done differently. Um, in undergrad, I worked in like a variety of different labs. So I was kind of trying to figure out then like what I was interested in, which was really helpful for me. I think if you have the opportunity to or, or want to like working in uh, like two labs is nice to see like comparing your research interest fit also like in terms of applying to schools later on it's helpful to have like that diverse experience um I did a thesis which I think a lot of people say is something good to do before you apply to grad school or have some kind of like independent research experience whether that's like maybe a summer I don't know what they call them here summer undergraduate research project or like a undergraduate research project during the year or some kind of like way for you to engage in like your own independent research however that might look for you during your undergraduate career would be great also to help you know if you want to do research and if that's something that's cool and interesting for you or if you decide that you don't like it that's a good a good time to figure that out like earlier rather than later um I also like many people here took a couple of years off so I worked as a lab manager for two years which was very very helpful for me in terms of, I think, like giving me the experience to make me a competitive applicant, but also giving me the experience to figure out, like, do I want to actually ap apply to graduate school? Like, is this something that I can see myself doing full time for multiple years? Um, and I went into it with the mindset of like not being sure if that was something that I would like. And it kind of changed my mind, which I think was a very, very helpful turning point for me. So I highly I always like recommend to undergrads take a gap year, like one year, two year. Um, I think it's really helpful if you are like on the fence and want to like also build your CV, build your experience, making yourself a competitive applicant. That's a great way to do it, but it's also good for you to like figure out what you're interested in. Um, I was part of the cohorts, cohort or cohorts that didn't have to take the GRE. So I don't really know anything about preparing for that, but if you do have to take the GRE in terms of being a competitive applicant, making sure you're starting like studying early for that and making sure that your scores are like on track with what they should be for the schools you're applying to but I get I don't have any experience with that so maybe somebody else can speak to to that but yeah those would be like my main my main tips for oh and then also this kind of comes with like having that more more experience either in your undergrad or taking a gap year but having people you know can write strong letters of rec for you that was something that caused me like a little bit of stress like towards when I was applying because I had to think back like they usually ask you for three um and so if you've worked with like in three labs or something like independently and like had enough experience in those labs that's great but um if you don't have like three independent labs seeing if you can foster like relationships or mentorships with PIs in other labs or lecturers or professors um but that needs to start like pretty early. Like it's not something that you can do like just a couple months before if you don't have that relationship already. So another way to be competitive is to have those three really, really strong letters of rec. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll speak on the side of being like a last minute person. Like I decided last minute I'm gonna go. Um, something that I always tell the students ITA is that, uh, let's say you're applying to a lab, you email the professors, the lab managers, they're very busy, they don't get back to you, and you feel very discouraged. Um, something I recommend doing that is uh, you email the graduate students <laughs> instead, uh, because they're more available, and you can also ask your TAs because they are graduate students. Um, just ask them, like, hey, I'm interested in the social cognition lab. And usually the TAs will say, I know someone in the social cognition lab. Uh, let me introduce you to them. And then immediately you'll have contact with this lab in person or on Zoom. Um, 
And then the second thing I want to hit on is that, uh, again, if you're a last minute person, any research experience is research experience. So um, I, I had to do research in the height of COVID. And actually, when I sent in my application for grad school, I only have three months of research experience total. So, um, but in those three months, I was working at a clinic at a hospital doing psychology studies. And we didn't have a lab manager. So I was doing all the procedures, writing everything. Uh, coding everything and then writing like how to do the analysis so um, you know if you can get any kind of research experience that's always welcome but if you're applying to psychology try to get psychology positions um, and then the last very last thing is that uh, for the GRE it can be stressful uh, it can be very stressful but there is a Reddit page, there's a subreddit called GRE where people post how they study. And like, these are real people, they're not like online tutors. Uh, so these are real people, they post their essays on it. And you have people like me who will comment on these essays and give you scores and give you feedback. So that's a really nice way to uh, study for the GRE without spending a lot of money on a tutor. Uh, yeah, so I'll I'll end it there so uh, other people have a chance to touch on something else, but yeah. Um, yeah, just what both Lucy and Jenny saying, research experience, I think is a huge thing. Um, in conversations I've had with PIs, um, one, I think, I'll, I'll touch on this a little bit, but I think it's a product of what Chloe is saying is like the type of program, one where it's rotation based, where you're not going in directly with a mentor, you have a committee of professors deciding who gets in and who doesn't. Whereas if with more direct mentorship programs, you know, the PI really decides like, okay, I'm gonna invite or bring these people in. Um, so across the board though, that can look like, you know, research experience. Um, I know some people view things differently where it's like the longer people have like been in research, it's more of a way where like, okay, you can tell this person has like, really thought about this or they're committed to this, especially when it's after undergrad. Um, you know, a lot of people here uh, seem to have taken some gap years and that's what I did too. I was the lab manager for a year. And for some people, that's a lot that shows like, you know what, no, they're committed to pursuing um, graduate school at like, and doing research in that regard. Um, again, though, everybody is different. I think for direct mentorship programs, that will be more, very more depending on the PI, but I think more of these rotation-based programs, they're going to care about that a little bit more. Um, in line with the research stuff, uh, unfortunately, people are going to look for lines on CV as a form of prestige. And some people have more access to that than others, just based on lab culture, who gets assigned to what. So trying to be in a lab where those opportunities are available to you, whether that's, you know, involved in maybe doing a research poster. I know UC Davis has an undergraduate research conference that people present for their honors theses, but also it's not just people doing honors theses. There are undergraduates who are doing research in the lab, and that's a good opportunity, um, giving you insight on some of the stuff that you'll do. So little things that you can add to your CV that'll show that you're committed to this. I'm trying to see what else. Um, I think it's also super important with these direct mentorship programs that if you can really, in your statements, you have to talk about, okay, how do I see my research interests aligning with these PIs? They're gonna be reading thousands, like many, many essays per application term. So you want your application um, to at least stand out in some way and really show that you've thought about how you're, what you're interested in studying aligns with what the professor wants to do. So many applications, I'm sorry, I'm like, well, this person studies, um, you know, sleep. I also like to study sleep uh, in this regard. But the more I think you go into detail about that, that's going to strike a professor's um, interest more because it shows that you've thought about this and like, okay, these are the kind of research questions I can see this student developing. Um, I'm trying to see if there's anything else for competitiveness. Um I think it's just really comes down to like some sort of evidence showing that like, no, this person is ready for grad school and they thought a lot about their research interests. And that can, again, kind of vary on what that looks like. But 
at least is there strong evidence for that that'll make you competitive. Yeah, so to sort of piggyback off of that, um, I think a big factor um, that like I've talked to my PI about this, um, that kind of separates the sort of top candidates for like PhD programs is like if it seems like you've really engaged with the research process. So like there's a ton of undergrads that like go through the research process, they'll like go into a lab for units um, and, you know, they'll like collect data and clean beakers and stuff. And that's awesome. That can be super valuable, valuable experience. Um, and sometimes that's all that's offered. So that's totally an access issue as well. Um, but I think that something you can really do is like try to push to be more involved and engage with the research process, even if it's just for yourself. So even if that's all that you're able to do in your lab, um, if you can like try to go to lab meetings, try to like read papers and talk to the grad students about them. Um, if you can show the people who are writing your letters of recommendation that you're really thinking about the topic, even if it's not the topic that you wanna study, um, just to show that you're really engaged and you're like excited about the research process in general, um, that'll give you a better time like developing your own research interests. And it'll also signal to the PI of the lab that you are in um, that you're really enthusiastic about this. And they'll try to push for you by writing you a really strong letter. They'll have stuff to talk about about you. Um, Cause I think it can be really hard, especially as a PI with like a lot of um, grad students and a lot of undergrads under those grad students to like write a letter about a student that they don't know very well. So if you like show your face in the lab um, and try to show that you're really engaged, um, I think they'll have more to write about. Um, so even if, if you can't do like a fully independent research project, cause I know that's a lot to ask, especially if you get involved like later in grad school, um, if you can just show that you're really um, thinking about the research in like thoughtful ways um, and trying to show your face around there, then I think that can really help um, in getting you a strong letter of recommendation. Um, and then also something that Lucy touched on that I think is really valuable is trying to do like a summer research program. Um, there's a lot of other, there's a lot of summer research programs out there. I did one at Purdue um, and it was like, I, I didn't know anyone there. I just like, sort of applied for a bunch of summer research positions. Um, and that program was awesome because I got to work on an independent project. Um, I got to do a talk and a poster um, and they did GRE prep, which I saved so much money by doing that. Um, and then I found out there that they were really pushing for this to be like a, like they were trying me out as a graduate student kind of thing. Um, so that was just like a really awesome program. And so that gave me like an option for grad school. So there's a lot of programs like that out there. You just kind of have to hunt for them. Um, and they can be a really good option to help you be more competitive for grad school and find like a potential lab. Um, so I can talk a little bit about what I did. I am a sixth year, so I had to take the GRE. Um, I have used like a couple different tools. I didn't have a, a tutor. I did everything like I would say by the book, but I had a giant Kaplan book. Um, practice tests are your best friend. Uh, just it's like the repetition, it's very uh, boring, but it is very helpful. Um, the GRE is expensive uh, and there are um, fee remission programs that you can apply for to universities that require the GRE, but you will have to pay up front and they will reimburse you. So those programs are out there and absolutely take advantage of them. Um, but just know that you will front the money yourself. Um, so for me, I was making uh, not a great salary uh, at the time. And so I could only afford to take it once. And I remember you know, my math score being kind of on the low end and being really concerned that that was gonna keep me out of graduate school. Um, so the way that direct to mentor programs work are you apply to work with someone, but you apply to the department. So the department is kind of like the first hurdle to get over and you need to meet their like minimum requirements. So you have to have, you know, a bachelor's, um, you have to, they give you a range of like GRE scores. And that's not like a hard and fast rule necessarily, but um, it's a pretty good benchmark of where you want to be. So if you're in that range, you know, the department isn't going to reject you based on your scores. Um, but the next step, after that is the mentor choosing to give you an interview and then choosing to extend an invitation um, to join their lab. So there are like tiers. Um, if the department rejects you, the mentor cannot step in um, and change that. 
right? So the first step is the department. Um, but then a lot of it is about the mentor. And this is a an ongoing conversation about equity in graduate school admissions, but in direct to mentor programs, um, it's very, very common for mentors to meet with students who are interested in joining their lab ahead of um, applications. So I met everyone that I was applying to work with in graduate school, either on the phone, on Skype, because it was a pre-Zoom era, um, or in person at a conference, I met everyone that I applied to work with. Um, we talked about science, we got to know each other a little bit. It's a bit like online dating, where you're like trying to meet someone pretty intensely for the first time after having internet stalked them a little bit. Um, and so, that was very, I was told this is the way to, you know, make the connection, make sure they put a face with the name, like this is how to get ahead. Some PIs um, in an effort to be more egalitarian and not kind of like have this hidden curriculum, like influence their decisions are not meeting with students before applications anymore. Um, so, you know, things are changing a little bit, but do know that especially if you're meeting uh, or if you want to work with uh, a more established or older PI that this may not be on their radar um, to do. So know that meeting them or asking to meet with them or asking to you know, have a Zoom call with them ahead of applying just to get to know them or get to know their lab or something, that's probably still the expected way to do things. Um, and it can be really difficult if a PI is, um, for instance, my PI gets about 20 to 50 applications a year. We do not extend interviews uh, to all of those people. And a lot of times it's the people that we no one has ever met and no one who like no one in the lab has any point of contact with who just get pushed to the side. Um, and this is right. It's about equity, like someone who doesn't know anyone in graduate school, whose parents didn't go to graduate school, um, are less likely to know about this hidden curriculum uh, of asking to meet or asking to, you know, have a point of contact in the lab ahead of time. Um, but from a PI's perspective, this is a five, five to seven year commitment of a student they're taking on. Knowing you having some, a colleague or a graduate student vouch for you is a big guarantee that this is gonna go better. So just know that that's their perspective. And so a big point of success is making contact with that lab, you know, having an opportunity to talk to the PI about their work protects you, right? You get to understand like, oh, they have one grant right now. So if you are their student, this is the project you are working on. If that's not of interest to you. You maybe don't want to apply to that lab and spend uh, that money to put in that application. Um, so I think it benefits both parties. But, you know, the times are, are changing a little bit. I'm like an elder, <laughs> elder millennial, elder graduate student at this point. So um, things, things have changed a little bit, especially uh, in the climate of post recovering COVID era. I also will throw in my, my gap year program was a two year fellowship at NIH. Um, if you're into biopsych or even if you're like deciding between graduate school and med school, this is a really great program. Um, it's paid and it's in person in DC. So I got um, bench experience, uh, microscopy experience, like doing hands-on um, things. We did brain scans and um, I ran experiments with monkeys all day, every day. Um, but this was a really great experience for me and really, really like important in bolstering my letters uh, for graduate school, but also my actual technical experience. And uh, the last question that we have prepared, and feel free to um, just briefly touch on the topic, but because I know it could be um, a very long response, but um, what does research in your field um, look like? So my field is developmental psychology, and I work primarily with kids between the ages of like three and 11. Um, and I have done that like for the past five years, I've only worked primarily in like with kids in developmental research. So what it looks like in terms of collecting research is I feel like it's a pretty long process, at least like as I've talked to friends and like people in my cohort from different areas, like working with kids and working just with like 
adult like or like human subjects data collection takes a long time so for us our programs like phd programs tend to like people tend to graduate like after five years or like around six years maybe maybe seven years um but research with kids i've found takes a long time and you need a lot of patience um but it's also very rewarding like i love working with kids i have four younger brothers i like like it's not something that's draining to me um which was something that was helpful in figuring out when I was trying to understand what I was interested in like what kind of research motivated me but also what kind of research did it make me feel like drained or like exhausted or unhappy at the end of the day um and this is where I landed but um I'm trying to think of what else this question might entail in terms of like what developmental research looks like all I can think about is that it's long but rewarding um I'll, if I think of other things I will pop back in and go over that because oh I guess we do a lot of like experiment or survey based research so it is a lot of like direct contact working with kids um I don't do a lot of like I guess group based research or anything like that so I guess, yeah, that's like a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with kids and parents, um, which is also cool for like disseminating research if you're interested in like science communication or getting your ideas out into the public, like talking with parents I found is a really, really great first step in terms of like translating your research ideas and findings to the people that like the parents of the people you're working with. Um, that was super rewarding for me. But yeah, I'll jump back in if I think of other things too. Okay, so I'm representing the quant field, but I feel a little bad because my lab is technically quant and animal behavior, so it's a little unusual and a little bit of an outlier. But essentially, quantitative is just a fancy way of saying statistical methods. So um, uh, it boils down to like how do you measure psychological concepts, which is important because it's very abstract and you can measure it qualitatively uh, via interviews or diary entries, but how do you convert that into numbers? Uh, so a lot of people I know in the quant field do do modeling, or they come up with new methods, uh, new ways to measure these concepts. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail about too many of them because these are more advanced concepts, but they typically include um, some kind of coding, some kind of statistical knowledge beforehand. Um, that being said, you don't have to be uh, like acing all of your like calculus classes. So you don't have to like uh, feel pressured that you have to be perfect at math. Uh, in fact, I only took intro to statistics like that whole course, uh, but it definitely depends on the lab. Like if you're uh, if your advisor or the person you're interested in demands more kind of advanced statistical knowledge and you've only taken intro courses, that's not a good fit. Uh, take a year off and then like, you know, gain some knowledge, try again. Um, I would also say that the benefits of quant programs, how it's different is that uh, it, it it's really not limited to just statistics because you're doing statistical analysis of psychology. So this can involve social psychology data, biological psychology data. Uh, you can really kind of touch the data sets of all fields of psychology. So if you're someone who really like everything interests you, but ultimately uh, like you're still interested in understanding why things happen and how do we measure it in numbers, then uh, yeah, I would recommend it. I also see a question in chat. So uh, would it look bad if it's a pass instead of a grade in stats? Um, I believe in the application process, they do give you a chance to explain what happened. So if it's like a family circumstance or like, uh, you know, you were not having a great quarter, uh, most of them will understand. But I would say that try to retake the class uh, in your institution or you can take a community college class if you can't do that you can do a online certificate which is it sounds scary but it's not that long um but but yeah like if you're missing some part of it and you feel like 
it's not enough, that's usually a good indicator of uh, like try to do a little bit more to make sure that you're still competitive in that pool. All right. Uh, I want to go into a little bit of what I do, but I will also don't want to take too long of a time. So I'll I'll come back if we have time. But otherwise, uh, go ahead. Yeah, so I study personality development and personality change. So a lot of the work in personality does a lot of self-report assessment. We're just basically asking people to rate themselves uh, on their personality traits or their goals or, you know, the stories they construct in their heads about themselves. Um, doing this um, with the actual people we're interested in, having people in their lives rate them on these different traits. And, you know, just impl asking the same survey over and over again across different intervals of time. We're doing a lot of cool stuff now in the field where we're using um, what's called ambulatory assessment or experience sampling methods, which um, they're similar but different. Ambulatory means like, you know how people have like Fitbits or they have little monitors on their phone that track their activity levels. We're using that data to see how it relates to people's personality and their behaviors, thoughts and feelings. And then experience sampling with this advancement in technology, you know, we can ping people short surveys um, during different parts of the day being like, hey, what are you doing? What Getting a better understanding of the different kinds of contexts and situations they're in. Um, people have also used um, iPods to record uh, people's daily lives and kind of transcribe those and kind of get an idea of what their personality is like manifesting um, just day to day. But yeah, no, some of the stuff I do, just kind of understanding like how people's identity interacts with um, their personality and their everyday lives, uh, really interested in who and why, um, how and why people differ in their personality change. Um, so yeah. Um, okay, so my research is in um, attention and memory. Um, and there are a lot of different methods, but sort of like the way that you start the process um, is like reading a bunch of papers, uh, figuring out what your question is, and then um, programming experiments. So I use um, like virtual reality a lot for my experiments um, with eye tracking. And so um, there's kind of a lot of programming that goes into that, but depending on the method that you use, uh, like I've also done online studies, um, those are like less programming. Um, so there's a lot of different sort of options depending on like what your research interests are and what kind of methods you want to use. Um, there's also a lot of other methods that people use like in my lab, like neuroimaging um, or EEG or electroencephalography, which is like where you put the electrodes on people's heads. Um, so depending on what sort of method you're interested in using, there's going to be like a different degree of preparation for that method um, and like different regulatory processes to go through. Um, but I basically just have like college students, like undergrads come into the lab and put on a VR headset um, or do an online study. And um, we measure like their reaction time, what they're looking at, um, things like that. Um, so there's some time devoted to um, programming the experiment and then actually collecting the data, which can take a while. But if you get a lot of like research assistants in on it, then it can go more quickly. Um, and then there's also programming on the back end when you're analyzing the data. Um, and so there's a lot of different methods you can use for analyzing data. It depends on what type of data you have, um, but usually um, we use some type of programming um, to analyze that data and visualize it. And then there's like the writing process um, where you're um, writing up your results, making it into a paper, probably presenting it like in a poster or a talk at a conference. Um, and so that's sort of like the process. And usually I have a couple projects going on at once, or I try to at least in case something doesn't work out. Um, and so there's usually like various projects that are in various stages of development. Um, and that's like what a typical day sort of looks like is like I'm working on one or a couple of those different processes. Um, Biopsych is another one of those areas of psychology where things tend to move a little bit slower than the mean. Um, especially in primate work, uh, especially if you do anything like developmental or longitudinal, like Lucy said, sometimes we're waiting for our subjects to grow up or to um, reach an inclusion age so they can be part of our study. Um, I study sleep and reproduction. So a big part of uh, my work was waiting for babies to be born um, or for females to get pregnant, um, which, you know, takes a little bit of patience. <laughs> um, 
but a day in my lab situation often looks like me collecting behavioral data. Um, luckily, I set a lot of my, my sleep studies up to run kind of automatedly uh, so that I don't have to be awake all night to make sure the monkeys are, you know, where they're supposed to be. So I use uh, essentially the monkey version of a Fitbit to track their activity and use that as a proxy to look at sleep so that I don't have to sit there and score their behavior all night long. Um, so I think there's a way to like thoughtfully design your experiments to make it um, kind of sustainable for you to collect the amount of data that you want or um, something like that. I found being strategic really helps uh, preserve your sanity. Um, another thing that I do uh, in addition to research actually is teaching. So Within the department, um, we have a lot of opportunities to TA different classes, but we also have opportunities to teach. So uh, you can do a teaching practicum within the department where you uh, teach, essentially co-teach a class with an instructor. And it's a class you've TA'd multiple times before. Um, so presumably you know the material and you're comfortable uh, moving into an instructor role. Um, and then you're if you know that goes well and your teaching evaluations go all right, um, you're signed off and you can teach within the department. So I've been teaching for the last few years. Um, I teach Psychology 159 um, and I love it. I love interacting with students at that level. Um, now that I've done it so many times, uh, it's a really comfortable rhythm for me. Um, I like mentoring other graduate students when they TA for me. Um, and I've really enjoyed exploring that area uh, as a potential career um, and developing that skill that I can bring really to an academic career, obviously with teaching, but also to a non-academic career in terms of science communication. It's a really valuable skill set being able to take um, very experimental, very, you know, neurobio uh, findings and distill them to a level uh, that undergrads of any level can understand, including those without a specific biology or genetics background. So I find that to be a really great um, challenge and a really great opportunity to develop those skills. Um, and it's something that you can explore as a graduate student. In addition to TAing and even like leading your own lab or discussion sections, you could lead a whole class. Um, yeah, so thank you to our student panel for sharing your experiences, um, any advice and helpful information to students. Um, so I want to leave the last uh, few minutes for um, participants, anybody in the Zoom meeting, if you have any questions for a specific person or for the panel as a whole, um, you can unmute yourself, raise your hand or leave, drop them in the chat as well. Um, so feel free to ask any questions that you have for our student panel. Um, I wanted to ask about the letters of rec. Like, did a lot of you guys get letters of recommendation from professors? And if so, like, how did you make those relationships, like, during big lecture classes? Um, and did you just go to office hours a lot? Or kind of how did you create that? Actually, I can take this one from both directions. Um, so as a graduate student instructor, um, I get requests a lot for students who uh, want letters of recommendation. Um, if I was a professor, I would be so happy to do that. I will say graduate student letters are actually not looked on super favorably by admissions committees, um, especially medical schools and master's uh, programs. Um, PhD programs tend to be a little bit more like if someone else will um, kind of like like a faculty advisor or the uh, faculty coordinator signs off on it, PhD programs are a little bit more um, accepting of that. But you want to make sure you're asking a full professor, so someone who has a PhD. Um, 
and that, that also can mean like an associate professor, an assistant, or an adjunct, but you want someone with a PhD um, because that tends to go over better. Um, from the student side, I had um, I had to have letters for my NIH program and then different letters for my graduate school application. Um, and when I left undergrad, I had worked in one lab. Um, so that professor wrote me a letter. Um, and then I had a professor who'd mentored me for four years, uh, who was retired, but he was my professor uh, during my early undergrad years. He wrote me a letter because he'd known me so long. Um, and then I had another professor who I had worked with in two classes, and she actually waived an, an entrance fee for me to get into her graduate class. So I had worked very closely with her um, in a small, small class. And um, the previous classes I'd worked with her and had papers. So she'd read like read my thoughts more than just seen my performance on a Scantron exam. Um, and we had an existing relationship from meeting in office hours and things like that. So I will say my most memorable students are the ones who talk in class and the ones who um, come to office hours and engage with the material and you know bring in information from outside the class and think about how the course applies to their lives or what's going on in the news or you know I teach reproductive uh, development so there's a lot going on in the news that's relevant to my class um, most quarters um, and those are the students that are the most memorable to me and the ones that I would be able to write letters for the easiest. Um, as I think Lucy said earlier, the more labs you're in, the more opportunities you have to have really in-depth relationships with PIs. Um, in our lab, we actually have so many graduate students that our PI doesn't work with undergrads directly. So when we have an undergrad in our lab who needs a letter, the graduate student will write it in conjunction with the PI, and then the PI will sign it. So she's still she's still writing the letter, but she gets direct feedback from the people that the undergraduate student actually works with so that it's detailed and personal and it's a really good letter. So think about that when, um, you know, if you work in a lab or let's say you have worked really closely with the TA, but you you know want a letter from the professor. Ask both of them. CC the TA on the email to the professor because the professor is going to turn around and ask the TA anyway. Um, so that line of communication uh, being open already, and you know, you can say, "I went to Chloe's office hours all the time," and you know, hopefully, like she can attest to, you know, how excited I was about the material. I hope my paper was communicating that I, you know, connected well. I I got this grade in your class. Give them some context to remember you, especially if it's been a little while. Um, it's not like the same quarter or the quarter right after uh, they've been your professor. Yeah, and um, for letters of recommendation, what I did was that I followed the advice that if you need three letters of recommendation, then I would suggest two academic, one non-academic, Ideally, you can have three academic, but that's not possible for everyone. So for my two academics, I had uh, my, stat my stats professor and my PI for my lab that I worked like for three months in. Not ideal, but an academic. Um, and then for my third one, I had, um, I'm trying to think. Oh my God, I can't, I can't remember my third one uh, off the top of my head. But uh, specifically for my stats advisor, I will say that I'm not a star student in the class, but I had a lot of questions about the homework and I care about um, like getting the homework right, even if I'm totally wrong when I show up to office hours. Um, and I think she saw that uh, I care about the material and I did finish the class with a good grade. Um, and that led to her offering me as a undergrad tutor for her next class, uh, because I already took her class. Uh, so something that you could do while you're in UC Davis is that there is the Psychology Learning Center. They take applications for undergrad tutors. And for these undergrad tutors, you take either Psych 1 or Psych 41, and then uh, you need to have someone vouch for you or if you don't have anyone to vouch for you you can also apply to demonstrate that you did well in that class but ideally you have a ta or a professor saying like yes you did well and you came to office hours so 
that can be a really valuable experience of uh like demonstrating that you have a good connection with the professor by showing your undergrad tutor and they know what you do as a tutor so they will be able to write that letter of rec for you thank you yeah no problem i i was also trying to uh answer Lucia's question too, which is very similar, but uh, I, I like the answer in the chat already. Yeah, I can like add on to that super quickly. Um, all of my like research experience was because I, I talk a lot in class and then I would like go and talk to the TAs. And I mean, in, in like good ways, like not like obnoxious ways, I hope, but like I, in the classes that I really was interested in, I feel like it conveyed like genuine interest and curiosity so if you are really like curious about a subject in your class like go to your TA's office hours and talk to them like you don't have to have a specific like question per se at least like some of the times I would go and just want to discuss something in class and then through that like make more connections with the TA's and then professors if they have opportunities in lab but don't underestimate like the power of just like going and talking to somebody if you're interested in what they do and want to learn more um, I think not a lot, like I'm a TA right now, not a lot of people come to my office hours. It's great time. Like I have two hours free. Like I would love to talk to, <laughs> to somebody instead of like just sit there. So don't underestimate that too. Yeah, as a grad is, student, like if you come to my office hours and talk to me for five minutes, I will like give my life for you. So if you just like show some enthusiasm, then like I'll tell all the faculty, like write them the best letter. So yeah, I, I really recommend doing that. Yeah, no one, nothing. Um, we love talking about our research. So if you don't know anything to say, just ask us about it and we will do most of the talking. You think I am kidding, I am not. Um, and it's also really cool to hear what students have to say about it. So if you don't know what to say, at least ask about that. A lot of times too, we're super happy to talk about how we got to grad school um, and like what it's like to be a graduate student. So you don't just have to come in to talk about class. Um, you can come in to get to know us and, and ask about, you know, our identities and that intersect with our graduate student identity. So um, psychology is a very uh, female majority field, which is not true for a lot of STEM fields. So I on the border of neuroscience and psychology and neuroscience is a very male field um, and I get asked a lot from NPB and psychology students about what it's like to be um, female in academia my experience as a very like femme presenting woman um, and what that's like to teach in that environment and to engage with male colleagues um, because I think a lot of my female students find that to be very intimidating especially when um, you know, we're not encouraging girls from a very young age to be uh, very present with STEM education. So I've found that to be a really rewarding part of working with students as well to kind of um, talk about what that's like to navigate the field and hopefully give really um, optimistic viewpoints of, of what that's like. I've primarily worked for female PIs and um, my experience has been really shaped by, by that. So, you know, show, demonstrating that early female mentorship and, and that positive experience. I, I hope to spread uh, the excitement for, you know, an encouragement for being a woman in STEM. Um, I have a quick question about the, 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 about the competitive of being a graduate student. Like I know it's super important for joining a lab and I have research experience. And is that also important if I engage in like a couple of uh, volunteer activities? Yeah, I don't know, should I focus more? Yeah, I know I need to focus more on the research program, but I don't know, is there any good resources for the internship or volunteer, is that? provided for students? Uh, I can try to answer that because I was a last minute person. <laughs> uh, so I'm not too sure about, because I didn't go to undergrad at UC Davis, 
but um i would say that anything like volunteer like put down your cv as long as they are not like middle school or elementary school activities you can put that on your cv um high school is a little borderline but if it's a significant one you can put it on there um and then for internships they are hard to get i understand this it's super super competitive yeah I, i've tried applying to multiple and i i didn't get any of them so um definitely do look for them and they can be important but i would say that research opportunities are easier to get once you know how to get them so again talk to your tas talk to your um graduate students email the graduate students and just say like hey you want to go for this is my research interest um and do you want to meet at a cafe and let's talk let's talk about your research your lab and then advocate for yourself so it's not it's not just you asking but also like i'm interested in this stuff uh i have this project in mind i have this question do you want to work on it together so be re like really really proactive and that can be uh the final step you need to like for this graduate student and say like oh this is a good person um come to the lab meeting like i will introduce you to everyone uh so in my lab there are two or three undergrads at the time and all they did was that they came to um like us as tas and then they're like hey i have I have this idea. Can I sit in on a lab meeting? We're like, sure. And now all three of them have projects with with the PI or with the with the uh graduate student themselves. So that's that's a good way to look at it. You have a bunch of graduate students in psychology. I don't know how many there are, but like, you know, find find a field that you like and just email all of them, but be specific. Not, don't mass email them. Thank you. Okay, everyone, uh, feel free to head out if you need to, uh, to our panelists. Um, but um, if any, ha anyone has any one last minute question uh, before we head out for the day, uh, now is the time to ask. Okay, we get it. You guys emails. Oh yeah, I'll I'll type them in the chat. And I also provided Chloe's and Lucy's who also left me their emails. So I'll drop them in the chat as well. And I'm happy to provide like my CV or any of my materials, um, my neurotic spreadsheet. So if um, that would be helpful to anybody, feel free to send me an email. I'm happy to share. <laughs>